I was actually requested to make a presentation on environmental governance, corporate interest, and democracy in Southeast Asia. I'm very happy to provide this contribution to this um, conference um, and welcome. Good morning, good day to, to colleagues. Uh, first, when we talk of environmental governance, many people would always ask, what is it? And if we look into the, the literature of what, of what the definition of environmental governance is, it's quite vague, actually. Like, but I did look into um, some of the definitions offered by um, the UN Environment Program. And the common thing that always comes up when you talk of environmental governance is it's a process that advocates for sustainable development as a supreme consideration for managing human activities through whole system management involving the government, civil society, and business. When we talk of environmental governance, um, apart from sustainable development, it also um, involves the issue of good governance, rule of law, and compliance and enforcement. Um, and in most cases, this is not just about discussing uh, policies, but um, implementing um, and enforcing and even monitoring um, the application and implementation of environmental laws. Um, and regulations. And many of us working across um, different issues on the environment in the Mekong and Southeast Asia have encountered this in, as we work on forestry, mining, watershed management, and in my case, um, on general policies at the global, regional, and national level on, on the environment and, and climate. And it is also no surprise um, when we talk of environmental governance, um, particularly in this region, that um, there are a number of mechanisms you know, where government, business, and civil society sit down um, in one table um, and in one room to discuss the environmental um, aspects of policies and also um, processes at the national, regional, and international level. It's also striking that in many cases um, where mechanisms and processes are laid down for environmental govern gov governance, that business and civil society end up um, in, one, in one table. So I give um, here some examples that I have been particularly um, involved in at the global level, like the UN Environment Assembly um, not just provides a seat, for businesses um, in the Environment Assembly, but also provides a separate forum for, for them, which they call Science Policy Business Forum. And this is really a glittering event with high-level personalities, all paid for by business. While we, as civil society, work for public interest, we are non-profit, and we receive grants from foundations or even from, from, from government, um, these are I'm referring to legitimate environmental civil society, for example. Um, it's not the same as those um, lobbying for the interest of corporations to sell something. And as I mentioned, for example, it is odd to see Shell you know, um, sitting as the, civil, as the business representative in a body that is supposed to talk about clean technology to address um, the needs for climate mitigation and climate adaptation. So it's not the same. And we'll, we see this also very concretely in the region, in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, where ABAC, the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, has been institutionalized for the past almost 20 years, you know, since 2000, 2003, as a formal body for business and industry to provide advice and views uh, from business um, into the processes of the ASEAN. And there's no similar process in ASEAN um, that provides um, in, an institutional seat for civil society to provide advice to um, ASEAN. Um, the forum, for example, the ASEAN People's Forum or the ASEAN Civil Society Conference that civil society has been organizing since 2005 um, is not even institutionalized in the sense that ASEAN does not um, in, does not um, recognize it as a permanent body or a permanent process, unlike um, ABAC or ABAC. We've also seen, of course, a lot of corporate lobby on environment and food issues in, in Southeast Asia um, in particular. Many of us working on agriculture are familiar with in, in industry, business and industry 
associations that serve as official lobby groups um, are also recognized by government, such as CropLife Asia. Now, CropLife Asia is this huge um, organization, association of agrochemical and seed corporations operating in Asia, like pulling together their resources for a lobby group that represents them in policy meetings at the national and at the regional level. And more familiar at the level of the of the region, particularly in Southeast Asia, is of course RSPO, the Roundtable for Sustainable um, Palm Oil uh, Production, which has hundreds of members um, that represent the different parts of the palm oil um, industry, you know, from producers all the way to uh, processing and manufacturing. So you have big names, huge huge names like Nestle, Unilever. Charoen Tokapan, um, CP on that end of the scale and also sitting as part of the members of the round table are small community enterprises dealing with palm oil. And of course, uh, as you shift into mineral extraction, you have chamber of mines at the national level. In the Philippines, for example, one of the most powerful um, industry lobby particularly in the mining sector, of course, is the chamber of mines, which is the association of all the mining um, companies operating um, in the Philippines that actually pay um, to represent them in various policy discussions, also indirect lobbying, both formal and informal, um, with the government and also the media um, on the issue of mineral mineral policies. And these are these are examples of how environmental governance um, operates. And bear in mind, what I said earlier, that environmental governance main goal or top, topmost um, agenda is sustainable development. How sustainable development is defined and also interpreted and um, operationalized um, depends solely, of course, on how the players are, are uh, the dynamics of the players are actually actualized, um, are actualized um, in reality and how they play out. Um, as we move into the fourth industrial revolution, we also see new players, new industry players um, that are not commonly um, associated with environment nor with food and agriculture that are gaining ground in terms of their role, investment, and also political importance. Like in the past uh, five years, we've seen companies like Amazon um, going into food and agriculture, like in the same way Microsoft. The Gates company has started collaborating with um, pharmacies and um, retailers um, such as Walgreens um, because of the control over big data. And again, closer to home, like those of us um, looking into into the the Belt and Road Initiative would probably um, know as well that below the radar of the Belt and Road Initiative is of course the Digital Silk Road. And the Digital Silk Road, of course, is not just an initiative of the Chinese government as the state, but also brings forward and brings with it um, advancing um, on, um, on, on, on China's fourth industrial revolution agenda are the big um, tech companies, the so-called bad techs, that's Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and Xiaomi. And um, there are a number of, ex of interesting examples of how big tech in China have actually moved directly and concretely on food and agriculture. NetEase, for example, uh, one of the world's biggest online gaming company uh, based in, in China has formed NetEase Agriculture in 2009 to expand its interest into big racing business, which is called Weijang. Um, um, NetEase has actually um, started um, growing happy pigs, um, which are organic and sustainably produced pigs and selling them in the in, in its own um, e-commerce platform, which was later absorbed by, by Alibaba. So the biggest uh, food retailers globally um, are not just the, the stores or the supermarket, but Amazon is included and also JD.com in China, which is the biggest e-commerce um, company in China as well as Alibaba, which is um, slowly but surely expanding, um, particularly in South Asia, in India, and Pakistan. 
And now, as I mentioned, um, the, the contours of corporate interest um, is changing um, globally um, in, the, in the food and agriculture and environment um, as a whole, largely with the adoption of, of, of new technologies like digital and data-driven technologies, automation and sensing, uh, molecular engineering, which is not just about biotechnology and genetic engineering, but also combining nanotechnology and using um, digital technologies um, to be able to do uh, faster, more efficient uh, mole molecular um, engineering. And this also includes um, fintech, um, such as not just e-commerce, but also the use of blockchain um, to to, to be to be applied across the food chain and as we go um, into further into bigger scale application of digital technologies that also includes earth systems engineering um, including geoengineering which also has a lot of far-ranging implications on on the environment I will not go into that but just to mention that to you and as I said um, earlier, it's not just about the big tech going into food and agriculture and the environment, but also you have existing players um, such as Nestle, such as um, Unilever and TP, um, Charoven Pokapan, going into the fourth industrial revolution. Like interesting to see, um, to look at um, news releases from TP in the last three years, boasting about its capacity to use AI, it's already using some AI or artificial intelligence in its poultry uh, business, as well as the Internet of Things um, in, in its um, operation and also the use of blockchain um, to be able to, to um, document and also track um, its supply chain. And as you, we will see further um, into the next, not even decades, but in the next few months, you know, how the integration of big tech and also traditional players in food and agriculture, um, CP, and also the big players um, at the international level like Bayer um, Syngenta, which is now which is owned by a Chinese company, um, Chem China, which was recently absorbed by Sinochem, and also um, Dow Dupont, which is now called Cortiva AgriSciences and BSF. All of them actually have um, ongoing partnerships with companies that provide um, big data, um, also um, that provide um, technologies um, that include um, sensors and also drones. You know? um, for example, um, Bayer has a long-term um, strategic partnership with XAG, which is China's biggest, um, biggest manufacturer of agricultural drones. Um, so they are partnering, so they're using now um, drones not just to spray, pesticides but also to gather data um, in the field on the the pests and diseases and also the practices of farmers and also um, Syngenta for example also has a partnership with DJI which is the world's biggest and most popular producer of drones that has shifted into um, production of agricultural drones um, so they're also developing autonomous vehicles um, small tractors that will also help farmers um, um, do away with labor um, and to deal with um, issues of high wages, um, militancy among the agricultural workers, and also the issue of um, changing demographics, such as uh, migration to urban areas and also aging population in the rural areas. So we have to also see um, all of these um, technologies happening in the context of, of Southeast Asia, where there's increasing urbanization, also increasing land grab, um, um, where many farmers have been marginalized, um, largely because young farmers are no longer there to work in the farm and also to defend rights in the farm. So it becomes easier for um, land grabbers to enter and consolidate farms. And in the context of farm consolidation, um, the role of big ag, you know, the agrochemical companies and seed companies um, are becoming more prominent and also their partnership with uh, big tech um, companies that produce autonomous tractors and also, um, and also drones. And what are the implications of this um, on democracy in Southeast Asia? It's quite easy to be um, 
impressed or even deluded that um, these technologies would help um, food security, would actually help farmers um, in dealing with um, labor issues and make farm work easier for them. But let, if we look closely on the implications of these technologies on who needs to benefit from sustainable development, the more we will see that um, there are big questions on who really benefits from these technologies. Do they really take into account um, the, bene the, the situation and also the needs of small farmers and marginalized communities? Like ETC has been looking into this, and our conclusion is that um, these technologies barely look at the, the needs of small farms. You know? the, the profit motivation is first and foremost, and it's not even farmers who make the decision, but corporations that are behind um, the development of these technologies, and in most cases across the region are actually supported by governments that are equally excited about being part of the so-called fourth industrial revolution without asking and who are benefiting and going back to that question on on who really um, makes the decision and is this really going to support those who are left behind um, in the development equation so looking into the implications of of this development corporate interest um, environmental um, governance and also the increasing adoption of fourth industrial revolution um, in the environment sphere, um, looking at the implications on democracy, it actually bears to mind um, the, the, the equation that I showed um, earlier um, in my slides on the role of government, state, business, um, and civil society. Um, now, um, civil society's role is becoming more and more marginalized as the as the um, hoopla or the excitement over the fourth industrial revolution gets bigger. And in the in the other um, spectrum, is that it gives more prominent role for big agriculture and for big technology in policy and decisions um, around the environment at the national, regional, and global level. Uh, we see this um, more clearly as we go into examples in the region, like CP or Charuen Pokapan. It's a very good example where you have um, board of directors or officials that are um, part of that revolving door between corporations and, and government or even the military um, circle. I was just looking at the profile, for example, of the CEO of, of CP. And the current role of the CEO um, in government bodies, deciding on education, deciding on policies. You know, like, is it hard to imagine how um, people who are selling big tech or big agriculture um, to be not to be promoting um, to be promoting their interests um, in these government policies? So there's also a lot of ethical issues um, involved in here as governments become more desperate to bring in business and industry into the policy making sphere. Also, um, there are bigger and bigger concerns about the surveillance, um, surveillance and implications on people's rights of bringing in big technology um, in spheres um, related to agriculture, food, and the environment. Um, the same drones actually take pictures of the farm um, to map out pests and diseases and also practices are exactly the same drones that are being used to um, monitor um, um, the, 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 the uh, activities of environmental defenders you know, in mining areas or in um, forest, forest areas, um, particularly indigenous peoples. Who, who controls these technologies makes this um, a very critical um, issue. Like who uses um, these technologies and for what are, are things that we should interrogate, um, that they should not be left in the hands of business and not in the hands of the state. And of course, um, there's a lot of violation of consent and suppression of dissent um, in, as, as a result of this. Um, like when um, drones take pictures of, of a farmer's uh, field, uh, there are actually um, issues um, that are coming up in the north, for example, where, where these drones um, are used by 
um, technology companies in partnership with big agriculture are actually um, being used without the consent of smaller uh, farms um, whose um, territory, whose area are actually being um, surveilled uh, for purposes of building big data um, to help um, big corporations um, design better products, quote unquote, that are more custom built to farmers' needs. And in the area of consumers, um, we talk of democracy. It's it also, of course, involves um, to a lot of extent choices. Like we may be, we may have benefited, quote unquote, from the use of e-commerce um, during the time of the lockdown across the region um, some months ago, and continuing in some areas up to now. But we have to 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 be very um, conscious that using um, e-commerce and also dependence of digital um, technologies um, is, does not come for free. Um, those of us who have, who have followed, for example, the controversy around Facebook's uh, business model that sells um, data from its users, free users, um, to companies that are not just selling things but are selling political uh, platform and also ad, um, advising and providing consultancies for politicians are very much aware of this on how social media um, information that we provide as users are being used, no, uh, not just to profit but also to manipulate choices, political choices in many in many instances, as we've seen in elections um, in the U.S. and also ele some elections um, in the region. Also. Um, um, when it comes to uh, farmers' rights and indigenous peoples' rights, um, dependence on um, the fourth industrial revolution and bringing this in the sphere of the environment, in particular um, in the area of minerals, forestry, um, food production, and agriculture, would tend to marginalize further um, the knowledge and um, traditional systems of farmers and indigenous communities that were built across generations, across communities in the region. Um, these are marginalized and considered not even knowledge, but um, just local practices. I've been to many um, discussions where this has been the framing and we have to continue challenging that, that much of the food security, much of the environmental conservation and also um, responses to um, the challenges of the climate crisis are actually still dependent on farmers' wisdom and also the traditional and indigenous knowledge systems um, of communities. So these are being assaulted um, in 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 all this um, in all this um, excitement over um, the application of the fourth industrial revolution on on the environment here. So um, I think these are um, some thoughts that I'd like to um, share, that we could open up um, discussions on this as we discuss and also shape um, the future of democracy in, in Southeast Asia. So I end my discussion there. So thanks for listening.